how long the country well what state the country is going to be in next week never mind next month um so to try and work out how rugby league is going to fit back into this bigger picture it's quite a tricky one isn't it can i can i ask you a question sarah that i honestly don't know the answer to but i know i know my answer and my answer is probably a foolhardy one but if um if say they were to announce like the nrl have you know end of may start of june if lockdown is over you can go to a game would you go to that first game back or would you be apprehensive given the the bigger health issues in society so when, when the season resumes if the season resumes whenever and this probably applies to our general day life anyway do we want to go back to offices take our kids back to schools all of that stuff but would you be comfortable going to those first games back yeah as long as it won't at Craven Park, obviously, because you never know what you'll catch from over there. <laughs> no, I, and I'm the same. I, I'd, I'd be straight In all there. seriousness, if someone yeah. says, If someone says legally I'm allowed to go there, the environment for me to go to is deemed safe, I'll be there. I mean, I was there the weekend before it shut down, just as you were, so it's like, you know, we're kind of a little bit silly with, with those sorts of things. But if I was told it was allowed, then I'd, I'd be there, personally. I don't know if that's the right attitude to have and it's not the attitude I have about almost every well everything I wouldn't I wasn't one of those people out at the pubs on that last night you could go to the pub I'm not one of those people going spending times in parks or going up to the Lake District or the Peak District or what have you but if it was a game of rugby league I'll be there yeah definitely sorry I've just had a text to say friends had a baby oh that's some good news and that helps us segue into some other nice sort of stories where people are trying to find you know heartwarming ways out of this ways to donate whilst helping the clubs earn some money themselves as well and warrington wolves have launched a scheme to celebrate the role of all key workers during the covid19 crisis they're allowing fans to donate a ticket for a super league fixture so all club supporters can go on the club's ticket site and purchase a match ticket for a league fixture once the season re- re- resumed and then Tickets will be the tickets will be donated to key workers who've played a pivotal role in fighting the virus in the low in their local area. So the club have extended that gesture to offer for every match ticket donated to the scheme, they'll meet it with a further match ticket, um, and uh, yeah, with their attendance to the game also obviously helping regain some of the lost revenue for the club during the crisis, crisis bring in new fans, but also give those people who've been on the front line something as a reward um, as well. And Wakefield have launched two items of clothing that show their support for the NHS. They've released a hoodie and a t-shirt, which can be purchased online. Two pounds from each item sold is going to support the NHS. So two uh, nice gestures there where the clubs are thinking about helping themselves with with some revenue, but helping celebrate and, and support the people who are doing great stuff out there on those front lines so uh, so that's another nice story as well as sarah's friend's new baby we have um some other news as well to to bring us outside of coronavirus linked news this one might get us talking uh, 4020 news reported that rugby league cares have reopened the application process for towns cities and regions to register their interest in establishing a national rugby league museum the charity wishes to work with a partner towards creating a world-class facility following delays to a previous proposal to open an exhibition within Bradford City Hall, which I thought was sounded really good at the time, but guess who was involved in it? Mr Wood, and it didn't happen. So um, where does that leave us? Uh, Sarah, if you were building a National Rugby League Museum, where would you base it? Um... I mean, in one sense, Huddersfield's the logical place. It's central um, to the rugby league world, and it's where rugby league started. Yeah, and if you could get the George Hotel, it'd be absolutely perfect, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I understand it's just been resold, though, recently, relatively recently, so I don't know where that stands, but yeah, that'd be good. David, would, is there anywhere you'd, you'd think to put it, or would you think of it a National Rugby League museum not being a in one location, maybe something that would be more movable? I really like the idea of it, but I just can't think of a place where it would be best suited. I, I, I've no idea. I mean, there's so many uh, places could stake a claim for it. Lancashire, Yorkshire, Humberside, Cumbria. 
Um, but where would people travel to view it? Where would they? Where's synonymous with rugby league that which would attract people? Can you put it somewhere where there's footfall anyway, or like your idea, put it um, have it so it's travelling, so it can be taken around where there's big matches. You can take it with you. I'm not sure really. I'm not sure which would work. I don't think a, a fixed place would uh, potentially work. Well, it'd have to be thought through where that is. It really would. Uh, Huddersfield would be like Sarah says the logical conclusion you reach if it was a, f- a fixed place I think the Rugby Football League Rugby League Cares will be looking for somewhere more to donate space for this rather than because they won't be I don't think putting together a big purchase packet um, seeing as they're a charity that I've got important work to do uh, beyond this even though I suppose a museum could generate revenue in the medium to long term but the other location that immediately always springs to my mind to do something to celebrate Rugby League is the farm in the middle of the M62. <laughs> because it's just so... Something that so many Northern. Rugby League fans have experienced all year round through all seasons, driving past the farm in the middle of the M62. So that would, to me, be like a, a far-out sort of place to put a Rugby League museum. I think it's, again, right in the centre of the Rugby League world and, and the place that... Rugby league fans love to hate the most, the M62. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah, I've certainly spent many, many hours on that M62. Um, but just play, just to play devil's advocate uh, around the Huddersfield thing, if it was placed permanently in Huddersfield, um, how, how attractive would that be to, to people to attend it, to go and view it? Yeah, so actually you'd be thinking maybe if you put it in a in a city that might attract more visitors like Manchester. Yeah, a, so there's example. visitors there yeah. anyway, or York, where there's visitors anyway. So people travel, tourists travel to those places a, a little bit more, I'd say, than Huddersfield. So they might be uh, looking for somewhere to go on a day out whilst they're there and could be attracted to it. Maybe people who's on the fringe of rugby league, rather than being somewhere dedicated like Huddersfield, I think it would only attract people who, who are already engrossed in rugby league. Yeah, and I think it's got to have that sort of key function, I think, of um, bringing people back in. So wherever it's put, it needs to attract footfall from people who know about rugby league but aren't aren't people like us who <laughs> would go anyway or don't need to go because we've seen the exhibitions through vi- virtual or in real life <laughs> experiences already. Um, you know, it's it's a tr- it's reattracting people as well as getting an, an interest to new people, like you say, but. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting one certainly the one thing I would say is it would be fantastic if we had a consistent rugby league museum collection that could either have a planned stay at different cities and towns or have a permanent base but that we do have somewhere to go and re- remember the, you know, the memories of the sport as well as the, the game and, and potentially things about what the future of the game could look like and things like that yeah, I'm a fan of attracting new people and using something like this to attract new people, give us a new image. You know, we've got the Huddersfield Northern image. We've got that one nailed. We own that one. <laughs> we, want to, we want to try and offer a little bit more, don't we? And this is an opportunity to promote our game. So I think we've probably got to think a little bit more modern and, and be a bit more thoughtful about it. And, yeah, potentially something city-based which uh, attracts more people who are on the fringe of the game would be a, a big yes for me, I think. Um, Sarah, do you want to tell us about the other piece of Rugby League Cares news that's come out this week? Yep, so Emma Rosewarne, the head of welfare for Rugby League Cares, will leave the sport after almost four decades of full-time service. Rosewarne joined the sport via the RFL in 1983 in the operations department before becoming the head of player personnel in 1988. She was promoted to a new role as administration executive in 1993, which included lead responsibility for events such as internationals and the Challenge Cup final, all operations and briefly match officials. By 2006, she took a key role in the implementation of the salary cap, rolling out the introduction of the live cap. However, she'll be best recognised for her efforts in player welfare. Um, Despite leaving the sport, she'll continue to work for the RFL one day a week as medical coordinator. Yeah, it's not... She's not a person that I've had any personal contact with 
what whatsoever but um the testimonials that you've seen from players and other people in and around the game over the last week as this news has come out i think underlines that she's played a key role in uh, in lots of people's lives within rugby league and so uh, you know congratulations on a great career and, and good luck in your part-time rugby league career and, and and whatever else the future brings i suppose i don't know if you guys have anything to add about emily i don't know if you've come across her in any way or or read anything this week that that's imp- that's stood out to you no she's not oh, a name sorry. i know but on the other hand you know four decades is quite an impressive stint isn't it definitely definitely so right okay yeah. that's the news from this week don't forget you can find the google form you can find links to that on our episode blog post each week if you click the link and throw in your views on any news story that you've read or that you think we're going to talk about or otherwise and we'll we'll chat about it on the show right let's move on to some match reviews <laughs> into the match reviews then and um sky did a great job of showing us some old footage from good friday's past uh, at the weekend on on well on, on friday which was good there was uh, our league had uh, an old challenge cup final rugby league cares on their facebook page are putting out some great stuff um before we picked up this tonight i was watching a little bit of the 1997 australia versus great britain super league test uh which was at old trafford i didn't, I didn't get to watch all of it because of uh of other stuff but you know that that's another place to go and watch stuff and everyone's own club sites and pages and all that are, are putting out the goods too so um, we'll start with tim g radio our friend tim we hope he's well he wasn't able to join us this week but don't worry he's not got the virus um wigan 24 saints 22 so he's talking about the game that was on the 2003 good friday derby that was on on sky that they played in full and he said if scully just did a normal pass rather than keep trying to flick it out of the back <laughs> yeah probably paul Schoolthorpe's um worst ever derby game I-, I would suspect what a fantastic player but but not on that occasion he was he was shown the way by some of wigan's youngsters sarah i don't know if you caught on to um the 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 recommendation netflix wise that people mentioned about the tiger um thing um so we watched the first episode last night but i think that the the star of the show has, has got in touch hasn't he for to talk about the 2016 good friday hull derby yes so joe exotic said those rovers boys certainly regret getting carol baskin in as a defense coach in the second half you see, I haven't got far enough to understand the reference particularly. <laughs> no matter how many times I watch it back, it surprises me at how easily the Rovers' defence reverted to their wet paper bag approach. At least Tom Andrews was too y- young back then to go and so has avoided some of the mental scarring. Hashtag 20 nil and balls it up. <laughs> so d- it is true, to be honest. Like, yeah, the fact that it doesn't matter how many times you watch it, you are always surprised that they could go from 20 nil up to losing it. Yeah, and I think another surprising uh, win was the 2018 Hull KR versus Hull FC game. And your, your dad, Joshua's granddad, got in touch on this when he said, an early sending off reduced FC to 12 players, which allowed the Dobbins to get a foothold in the game whilst FC regrouped. Taylor, Bowden and Payer matched up and got all over the Dobbin pack, allowing the team a man short to create an overlap time after time. Jake effectively finishing off in the second half as he strolled away, waving to the chasing Dobbins. Um... Let's do always in our shadows, shall we, whilst we're, whilst we're talking about it, and then we'll wrap those kind of games up together, Sarah. Yep. So always in our shadow um, said 2016, 20-0, and they fuck it up. 2018, man advantage for most of the game, and they fuck it up. We could only dream. <laughs> yeah, but basically, um, always in our shadow, instead of going at those particular games as, as imagined a, a, a game that didn't happen this good Friday and how that one was was managed to be won against the odds by Hull FC but yeah what, what do you oh, remember sorry of, I missed the start of that review what do you remember of those um, those two games in particular because like always in our shadow says you know you'd look at, at 2020 at Craven Park and think how will they fuck this one up because they fucked yeah. those last two up 
Yeah, I mean, um, so I rewatched the 2018 one, um, and you know, we 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 were all right for eight minutes. Then Beretta got sent off. I still think it was a harsh sending off, but I think it was 